Hey everyone, my name is Dan Shemolinsky. People like to call me Shimmy, and you can too. And welcome back to our sample school, our deep dive into sound paint. And we have made it to the very end. Yes, you are graduating. We have walked through every feature that you have in sound paint, at least as of version 2.5. And we do intend to keep this series going for future updates, future versions, and added features. So today, I thought a great way to bring this full circle would be to make a variety of programs from scratch, teach you how to save them, and talk about what I'm specifically using from the course every step of the way. Now, the very first one I'm going to do is using the 1928 Grand because I'm a big believer in showing you stuff that you can jump into at home and follow along with instantly, and it's free. And let's try a couple mic positions. Let's see how the player mic sounds. I think what I'm gonna go for is kind of a hybrid sentimental piano, something you could definitely use at a tender moment in a film score or a more vulnerable pop song. And to me, the player mic is just a little more evocative of that texture. My first instinct right out of the gate is to compress that piano. Because if you remember from our effects video, compression makes the softs louder and the louds soft. So for a more sentimental texture, we're gonna want to really emphasize the quiet stuff. I'm also tempted to do a velocity zoom to really kind of almost limit the amount of loud that I get from this piano. Let's try 90. Already, it's a little bit more sensitive. But I want a little more headroom on that. Let's try 100. I like that. Let's go ahead and load a compressor to get that really, really kind of poppy sound. And I'm actually gonna start with a preset called Pop Piano. The slower attack and quicker release, so the amount of time that it takes for the compression to start and the amount of time it takes for it to release is very standard for this kind of a piano sound. Beautiful. Now with compressor settings, you're gonna wanna make small adjustments because every instrument is different. I like this threshold where it is, but maybe I'll bring the gain a little bit down and speed up the attack just a little bit. So I'm doing that to basically just get a more even tone so it's not quite as fluffy as the preset. Next, I'm gonna bring in an EQ because I wanna really fine tailor some of these frequency ranges. Now remember, equalizers cut or boost areas of the frequency of your program. So do you need more or less lows, more or less mids, more or less highs, and how much? My first instinct is that I want this to be a very warm sounding piano, so I'm gonna give some kind of boost to the lower register. Typically I find somewhere between 128 and 256 is a nice like warmth area. You can kind of just fish around until you like the response that you're getting. A good trick is to raise the Q value. So this is actually making your band thinner so that you can explore in depth what each frequency sounds like. Kind of the warmth that I'm looking for. So I'm gonna make that kind of subtle. And I'm hearing kind of a mid-range register snarl, kind of like resonance that I don't really like. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing I just did with this second band and use the third band to fish around for the mids. Hear that kind of overtone sound? Yeah, so I'm gonna pull some of that out And then always when I make EQ changes, I like to toggle it on and off to see what the big difference is. So I like that, it's mellowing it out a little bit more, it's giving it more low end presence, it's cutting some of the mid range snarl. One thing I will mention is you do have control of the tone of the compressor, which is yet basically another filter, so making it brighter or darker. Right now in this preset, we have it set to 9% high, but I want you to hear what it sounds like when we mellow out the piano even more on the compressor tone.
Next, I'm thinking about adding a very subtle kind of emotional delay. Now you'll remember that delay is taking the sound and repeating it some set amount of time after the initial attack. So my first instinct is gonna be to use the Bucket Brigade because I know by default, the character of that delay is to be duller on the repeats to kind of soften out the tone. That's nice. One single repeat. Now, because this is kind of a sensitive moment, I would be interested to hear what it sounds like with like a very fast LFO on the delay. So remember, LFO is a low frequency oscillator, basically creating motion in another aspect, the frequency, a parameter, at a speed that you choose. But let's go ahead and crank up the depth to max so we can hear what that slow LFO sounds like. Almost phasing, right? Let's bring up the rate. Even more. It's giving like a little bit of vibrato on the piano, but we're actually just hearing the vibrato on the delay. There we go. Now, if I'm doing some kind of cue, I may want to bring up the brightness of this piano at some point using a controller. Like if I'm playing very, very soft and the scene is kind of building to something a little bit where a brighter sound would be good, I could control that overall tone by maybe assigning a MIDI CC to the tone of the compressor or to the parts tone itself. It's currently set at minus 15. Maybe I'll split the difference and give it a range of negative 32 dark. Like that amount of control. And then I'm feeling a Lexi reverb, but kind of a cloudy profile. And by cloudy, I mean very diffuse, a lot of spread, 100% on late, maybe dial back the early. Pre-delay may work, but since we already have a delay on there, I wonder what that's gonna sound like. Actually really nice. The sound is also getting a little bit quieter. Have you noticed that? As you add more effects and you have more of your dry signal being cut out by effects, it may bring the overall volume down. Two solutions to that. You could add another compressor. Definitely okay to have multiple instances. Just be intentional about how they're set. We can also experiment with moving the compressor after the effects. And hearing how that sound changes. Slight difference. And then obviously the third option is just to turn the volume up on your individual part. So I just basically did a little post effects shaping here. Huge difference, really rounded out the tone, gave it even a little bit more of a bass boost. Did some subtle cuts on the mid-range, but let's go Hollywood. Let's bring in a little bit of shimmer reverb. Maybe also on the mod wheel, I think that could be really cool. I like that. And the tone, I'm gonna keep it pretty dull. So it's just kind of a little bit of a cloud. Now, sometimes it takes a real life playing example to hear where you're not super happy with things. So basically the sound was a little too wet for me, a little too disconnected from what I'm going for. So I'm slowly taming a few of these things back. That's more like it. Done. <laughs> I like that. 
So now that I have a program that I like, let's talk about how to save it. Now, if you want to use our naming protocol, if you will, we name the programs like this. Basically, the largest heading starts first, so this is a piano. Then you'd type in either a shortened version of the library name or the full one if it's not too long, but in this case, I'm just gonna go 1928 Vintage. Then I'm gonna name my program. I think a good one for this would probably be Sensitive Touch, something artistic. And then we sign it with our initials, so all of my programs end with DC, and then you just hit enter. Now your program is not saved at this point. Very, very important to note that. The way to do that is to click the little hamburger menu here and click Save Program to User Library. Now you're given some tags here. You can pick which one makes most sense. So in this case, it's gonna be piano and click save. Now that program will show up in a different place than the factory programs. But if you click user library, there it is. All right, what do you say we do another one? All right, how about we do a big cinema trailer style hit, just like a boom kind of sound that has all kinds of motion and trail happening. So I'm gonna start my sound with a synth bass. Let's get a really hard hitting synth bass. Polywax is a good place for that. Now remember, the arrow keys allow you to audition parts or programs. So I'm gonna go ahead and just like lean into a low D flat here and uh, arrow down until I find something epic. It's that kind of cinema-y synth oscillators beating against each other. That's what we want. Ooh, here's an interesting thing. I like the swell of that whoa bass, but I don't necessarily think the tone is what we're going for. I want something more along the lines of dark and phasey. So I'm wondering, can we get that whoa motion to encapsulate the dark and phasey bass timbre that I like? Any ideas, class? I'm thinking morph. So here's what they sound like when played at the same time. Don't even really hear the whoa. I'm gonna enable morph. Whoa. Very interesting here. That's the sound that I like. I definitely like that kind of alive morphing sound. It's like it's breathing, right? I love that, but we are losing a little bit of the fundamental. What's stopping us from loading another part that's a little bit simpler? Interested in hearing what this all sounds like together. Woo! Maybe I want the third part to kind of mimic that whoosh entrance, but I don't want to morph it with another instance of woe bass. Remember, we can shape volume using envelopes. So I'm gonna toggle off my first two parts here and head over to the rack section and pull up an ADSR. Now I'm going to kind of approximate the shape of the woe. So what we just did there, remember a quick refresher, attack is how quickly something enters. Sustain point is the level at which your part is holding when I'm sustaining a key. And decay is the amount of time it takes to get to that point. So if I want it to go, whoa, I know that I'm coming back to somewhere other than full volume. So I'm gonna want my sustain a little bit lower. And I want the decay to be maybe a little bit longer than the attack. I want it to be whoa, because the O oh is a little bit longer than the woo. But let's hear how that sounds with everything. Nice. We found a bass sound we liked. We found another bass sound we didn't like as much, but we liked the whoa emphasis aspect of it. We morphed those two sounds together to get the whoa, but we lost a little bit of the fundamental, the, the beefiness of it in the process. So we added a simpler third bass. This is all from the same library. And then we're using envelopes to shape the entire program so that everything has that kind of woof, throb motion. Now, let's say I want a punch on the beginning of this sound. I'm gonna click on part four here and head up to some of our hybrid cinema stuff. There's quite a few here, but the one that I'm thinking of using right now is called sub hits. These are big impacts, immediate responses, but with a lot of sub information. So it's gonna give us that snap and kind of resulting plume that we want from this style of bass. Now, one thing that we don't want for a part that's gonna go like that is a slow attack. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is decouple our ADSR here. Now that doesn't change the settings for these. It just means that when I move the slider, it's not gonna affect all of them. And I'm gonna take part four, bring the attack and decay back down and just get it in its natural state. So let's try this part here. Sub hits, drums, movie hits, effects, 808. Yeah, we're looking for like an 808 style. 
Yeah, oh. I like that one. So, because this is a non-tonal hit, and I want it to be on every key, I'm gonna do one note same, because it's not a tonal part, so that that hit happens consistently on every key. Let's go ahead and toggle in our other parts here and hear what this sounds like. It's good, but now that I have that punch, I feel like my envelope is a little too slow on the other parts. I'm gonna toggle off the morph part for now and just deal with this beefier synth bass part. Let's go to this guy here. Yeah, now I'm actually almost hearing that immediately. Yeah, because the hit kind of like pushes it, right? And I'll get my throb from the sound itself and part three. I'm gonna also lower the volume of this hit here. I might bring everything up using a compressor. Just a little bit of fluff on those settings here. Now, I feel like it's missing some connective tissue between these two types of sounds. You've got this really hard hit and then woo, this kind of throbby thing, right? I think we need another hit to kind of fade between the two. So maybe something that's not quite as percussive. We have the percussive element, but something that has a little bit more trail to it. I'm thinking about heading over to part five and pulling up another sub hit. Let's see if I can find something here. gonna treat the whole thing with reverb and a lot of these sounds already have reverb in them except for that one it has a little plume of reverb but nothing that would sound weird if it was in another reverb I'm gonna go with it dude yes yes but that fourth part is still like too percussive to me so we could try to like lower the volume a bit that certainly helps a lot. We're gonna do an overall mix here in a second. So let's build it from the bottom up and start with the first two parts and make sure we like that. The parts do still have their own volume control when you're morphing. I definitely still love that, but maybe we could bring the tone of it up because we have such a strong fundamental on this third part. It's really mostly grit at this point. And with that, why don't we start like a little panning happening here on this part. I'm gonna use an LFO to get that part, just that part, that kind of morphed part, moving a little bit subtle left and right. So we're gonna add an LFO and change our bias to center so we know where it's coming from. I like that and I like that exact tempo. We can honestly make it even just like a little bit wider. Digging that, now let's bring the fundamental bass tone in here. The fundamental is like being able to hear the pitch, the clarity of the pitch that we're using. So that's the whole purpose of this third part is, is just to make sure that we're really getting the tone that we want. And because I kind of shaded the first two parts to be more high end with the tone knob, I'm gonna do the opposite with this and cut a fair amount of the highs from that so they don't clash so much. And that should be nice. Bring this down to zero and slowly work it in. I'm gonna bring in our fourth part here now. And then bring in that fifth part. That's, that's, that's too loud. Let's try cutting this fourth part and leaving the fifth part in and see if that suffices. I like that more. too much trail on that fifth part, I'm going to grab an envelope and just rein in that release.
Yeah, nice. So no shame in trying a couple different parts to achieve the same thing and cutting one. I don't know if this gives me anything now. Actually, a little percussive. I Gives a little bit of a little bit of kind of noise to it, right? Now I'm gonna head back to our compressor because we've been doing a lot of changes here and we can kind of dial this in so it's maybe not as throbby, not as loud, or more throbby might be cool. Now I'm noticing a resonance there that I don't love. I think it's just that this part is where that resonance lives and it's just too loud. And we can back off the filtering on that tone. There we go. This is sounding good. I like the balance of things as they are. I like the panning, but I feel like it could be a little gnarlier and I want to use an analog distortion to kind of get all these players in the same room, in the same ballpark, under the same final polishing coat, if you will. That's what we're going for. Now, here's something. This is going to add a lot more lows, especially in the sub region. I'm gonna go ahead and just grab a simple modern analog filter here. I don't want any resonance, but I'm gonna go ahead and change it to high pass. Now remember, high pass filters allow high frequencies to pass through, cutting low frequencies. I'm gonna mess with some distortion profiles and settings here. Oh, the brass knuckles are so good. Right away, I'm gonna want MIDI control over that. And over my trim, which is gonna give me a little bit more gain. Nice. Now we gotta put this in some kind of reverb, something with a lot of diffusion. I'm actually considering a long plate reverb. Now remember the plate profile is definitely like more metallic, more resonant. Ooh, I mean, that's cinema right there, right? Overall gain can come up. All right, let's save it. Now, you can change the heading. If you wanna put this under like hybrid, that's cool too. Definitely more of a hybrid cinema vibe. So I'm gonna go ahead and call it hybrid, sub hits, destructo base. Why not? I go here and save program to user library, change this to hybrid cinema, and boom, there it is. Moving right along, let's do something with like orchestral instruments. I'm feeling winds. Let's use legato and key switches now. And what I wanna try and do is basically set myself up so that I have a large ensemble of say three players and I want key switch control over bringing them in and taking them out. Let's start with this alto flute cause I just love it and do a deca mic part. Then I'm gonna grab clarinet. They play in beautiful unison. And then let's do English horn as well. I think that'll be a nice blend. Woo, that's really, really nice. But if I wanna quickly bring these parts in and out, I can assign a key switch to multiple combinations or just the individual parts themselves. I'm gonna bring up the key switch module. And you can already see that it's assigned to C1, C sharp one, and D. Because of our range, I think I'm gonna need the second octave of all those. And now I can hop from part to part. And pushing two keys at once will bring two part unison in. This is 
is a nice little like trio of wins I have going here. And I can really control who's playing very seamlessly. I mean, this is just an easy, simple way to control my ensemble. And if I want two parts to always come in together, so if I want part one and part two, the alto flute and clarinet to always be paired, I could just change the clarinet's hot key to the same one. So now my only additional hotkey is adding the English horn. Now, of course, we can affect the legato of all of these separately, so you can get each part playing exactly how you want. And then I'm gonna put this at a nice classical Lexi reverb hall, and why not play some chords? So I was able to momentarily bring out the English horn for a solo line and then join the other two players. You can also get really creative with limiting key ranges. So if I had a lower instrument like the bassoon and I wanted to play a low line somewhere in the middle of that, I could load up just a simple sustain part and basically limit the other three so that it doesn't go as low as the bassoon and limit the bassoon to not go as high as the other instruments because at a certain point it will start to stretch. So maybe I want just to play something in that range there. We're gonna go key range, something like that. And then I have to limit the bottom of these to that top note in the bassoon. And it's just that simple. So now the bassoon won't play above and the other three parts won't play below. Pretty clever. Ah, I also did notice that my bassoon is assigned a hot key currently. I'm gonna assign it to C2 as well so that it's kind of always on as it's playing. But you won't hear it because I've limited the range. So only when I go down for that low line will I be able to hear it. That's pretty neat. And obviously it takes some practice. You are kind of learning a new instrument here using key switches. And playing legato instruments kind of takes its own touch as well, though you can make some really simple adjustments to the legato module in the rack section to match the effect that you're going for with how you play. It should be as simple as sit down and play chords, but get beautiful legato textures. So yeah, there's not a whole lot to that, just a little bit of reverb, but if I like that pairing, if I wanna save that, I might call it something like winds, legato section four so i know how many instruments there are and then maybe ks for key switches or something and then save program to library we're going to change it to woodwind and we're set we've done a simple treated kind of sensitive piano a big cinematic bass a nice grouping of legato winds i say we close out and do something that i feel like is really at the core of a lot of sound paint libraries which is blending acoustic and electronic in the same instrument the same library the same program we haven't used the ARP yet to make a program, so I think that'll be a part of it. One of the really cool things about these legato libraries are that they actually will keep up fairly well in an ARP. So I'm thinking something synthy. Maybe we do some kind of like sequence where we've got kicks on all four, a synth line, and then we bring in some legato instruments with the mod wheel. Oh, it's ambitious, but I like it. Let's go find a good kick. My personal favorite kick is from the Red 22 library. I think this is just the best thing ever. really like that kick. Now I'm gonna have to get a little clever here because I'm gonna have to work this kick into the sequence that I'm doing with the ARP. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have this be one note same. And then after I've selected that, I'm going to limit my key range to literally just this C. So now by doing one note same, I took that note and put it across the whole key bed, but I limited the key range to just one note. 
so that it only lives there. I'm gonna tune this down a little bit just to give a little more. I like that. And to make it snap even more, I'm gonna use a touch of offset. Remember offset is where in the sample you start playing it. Just a touch because we did detune it, so we're missing the front of that transient. But I wanna make it snap even more, so I'm gonna do an envelope on this part to a zero point, and I'm gonna bring up the decay, meaning that when I'm holding down the key, there should be nothing. But the decay stage will allow us to kind of fine tune how short we want that kick to be. I like that. Cool, so we've got our kick down there. Let's find a synth sound, something really arpy and fun. I know we've been using the polywax a lot, but it's got this great arp in here called Round Town that I just love. Ooh, this is gonna be fun, I'm already getting excited. Okay, let's record something fun. Now, I'm going to have to play the kick in unison with my note here so that it records the kick as well. Remember, it's a polyphonic sequencer, a polyphonic arc, so it can do chords. Let's slow the tempo down a little bit. I'm gonna do just some little dynamic changes here to kind of really emphasize those kicks. Get some flowing motion on every other one. See how that sounds. Now I think already I know I'm gonna want like a little vibrato on that pitch, but maybe not all the time. So I'm gonna go ahead and add an LFO to it, change the bias to center and bring my range here. Yes, I want that, but not all the time. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a MIDI CC to the amount so I can bring it in. That's what I want. Now I'm gonna add kind of a bass sound from I think the Polywax library as well. And I want this to just trigger on the root, which is C. So let's load in this grizzly part here. So I'm gonna do a one note same. On just a C. So that means that no matter what is happening in the ARP, it's always gonna boo doo 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 doo. But because we have velocities in the ARP, it's gonna be kind of like modulating the volume of it. which I think is a really cool effect and one we might want to assign to the mod wheel. Obviously, we don't want this to be too front and center. I like that. And we can also assign that MIDI CC to the tone. We can do it the tone of Round Town a little bit as well. So now we have this little natural crescendo happening. But I promised you a legato instrument on top of this. It's kind of doing it for me. It's weird because we're going below the legato range, but I don't mind it because it's so connected for the upper stuff. Maybe the flute comes in with the mod wheel as well and we bring in a touch of digital delay at that time, but not that much.
sense of distortion. So cool. Ready for the final step, which I think is going to blow you away. I want a cord to enter as I raise that mod wheel. Now this is going to be a little tricky, but I think it's going to work. Let me find a pad that I like. It's probably going to be in the JX8 library because I really, really like that one. This is a very specialized part. This is almost like I'm taking a compositional approach to creating a program, which is something that I love to do in SoundPaint. You can compose pieces in SoundPaint. Let's try this one. That's the one. I'm gonna load four instances of this part and I'm gonna one note same each of those notes in the chord. Then I'm gonna make the release super long so that every time the ARP hits, it's not gonna die out. It doesn't actually have to be that long because it's re-articulating on every one, but I'm gonna make it like a second and, and start there. And then I'm gonna bring all of these up on a volume slider. So let's go ahead and just cut that range in half. Let's say like maybe negative 17 and start there. All right, here we go. Need some reverb. I'm gonna go back to the plate. Mess around with the settings here. I only want it in when the flute is in. We can even do like a kick drum swell too. Bring up some volume on the round town as well. Okay, that's wild. I don't even know what to title this under. Let's just go synth sequence with flute. That's an understatement, but. So yeah, there you have it. I feel like that's a good one to end on because we used eight parts. We used one note sames in conjunction with an ARP with velocities. Plus we also played like chords to make sure the kick was hitting at the right time. Combining a drum machine with an old Russian synthesizer with the Roland pad machine, the JX8P and a 1987 alto flute legato part. I'm feeling myself after that one. That's great, that's fun. So whether you just want a single individual library, a beautifully sampled legato wind instrument or trumpet or string instrument, or you're looking to use hybrid cinema stuff, you're trying to get into a hybrid instrument, something that doesn't exist in the natural world, but it's perfect for your trailer or your score. Or if you're trying to actually write music, SoundPaint is there for you. It's come such a long way in such a relatively short period of time, and I honestly cannot wait to see where it goes from here. So hopefully this series has given you a firm understanding of all of the options you have at your disposal in SoundPaint, and hopefully taught you a little something about the art of sampling along the way. We're very passionate about this engine here, and we hope you are too. It's truly revolutionary, and I think will be a game changer for years to come. Congrats on graduating. If you have any specific questions, you know the community is ready to answer them. We have a very active Discord where users, sound designers, and developers alike all occupy the same space because we all can't wait to see what you do with SoundPaint. Anyway, that's all we have time for today. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I will see you when I see you. This is Shimmy, signing out. Take care.